There's also some theories about it, isn't it? There's a theory about we, uh, sort of extraterrestrial asteroids hitting Earth with some sort of life, early life forms on it. They say we, we evolved from monkeys, right? And then monkeys evolved from something that came from the sea and the water. Or oh, there is the, uh, uh, the ancient oceans where there was enough right ingredients coming together and the spark of life happened. Um, I feel like from cells, kind of. Because cells are kind of lively, right? And then they will just keep expanding until there's complex creatures. Just well, like evolution kind of thing. Evolution from like very early carbon-based sort of soup-esque things, I would guess. But again, I'm not qualified. <laughs> I say it just evolved the same way, you know, um, people evolved from fish. As I said, maybe that kind of advanced race that we don't know about. But when we do find out, maybe it'll become clear. Because it does not make sense for us to be this. Everything just has a system. Everything makes sense too much. The developing of like a single cell. And after all the years, we are here. The main theory is evolution. How everything started from bacteria and then developed and yeah. Uh, for that, I'm not too sure. I think there was a recent now there's because it's basically how chemical reactions can become into biochemical. We used to think it happens by chemistry in the, you know, in, in the primordial slime. I don't know whether the theory that life arrived as you know, cosmic dust from a meteorite um, will prove to be true or not. It just began. I mean, if we're going to go into um, creation or where the whole thing started, we can also go and better look at God. Who created God? Who are we to tell where we came from? Because we don't know we weren't there. Dennis Alexander is the founding director emeritus of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion in Cambridge, where he's also an emeritus fellow of St. Edmund's College. He is uh, probably um, best known for his work in uh, molecular biology, genetics, and that kind of thing. He's a past chair of the Molecular Immunology Program and head of the Laboratory of Lymphocyte Signaling and Development at the Babraham Institute in Cambridge. And, well, we may not find exactly what that means tonight, but you can always ask him afterwards. Um, he's previously been uh, involved with Imperial Cancer Research, now Cancer Research UK, and spent 15 years developing university departments and laboratories overseas, latterly as Associate Professor of Biochemistry in the medical faculty of the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, where he helped to establish their first national unit of human genetics. His latest book is, and I've had him on my show to talk about it, it's a fascinating book. His latest book is called, Is There Purpose in Biology? Uh, Dennis lectures and debates widely on the topic of science and religion, and recently defended the motion, this house believes that science will never have the answers to life's biggest questions at the Oxford Union's famous debating society. And apparently the motion won easily. Well, ladies and gentlemen, can I just say what a huge privilege it is to uh, be here this evening in this wonderful venue. And I think it is an amazing thought, isn't it, that as we sit here this evening, uh, if it wasn't for our DNA, we, we just wouldn't be here. And I'm sure that we've all looked many times at our own parents and wondered um, how much of their own DNA has shaped our own lives and made us what we are. Are we going to be like them? Are we going to follow their medical history? Are we going to really end up just being like our parents? How much choice do we really have in our own lives? I think in practice we can all probably remember uh, times in our lives when we made pretty big, big decisions that in the end uh, changed the whole course of our lives. Sometimes perhaps we made it in a bit of a hurry. I remember chatting once with a French scientist, a friend of mine, and I was asking him uh, how he became a scientist. And uh, he told me that in his French high school one day, his class was told that today you need to decide whether you're going to pursue the sciences or the humanities. If you want to do the sciences, just go upstairs. If you want to do the humanities, just stay right where you are. And my friend said he had 
absolutely had no clue as to what to do. But he had a friend who said, I want to be a scientist. Let's go upstairs. So he just went upstairs with his friend in a moment, a transitory moment of decision, and that's how he became a scientist. I'm sure we've all had those sort of experiences. I can remember in my own life uh, the big choice as to what A-levels to do, and I'm sure many here have had that memory as well, and some of you may be here this evening having that choice to think about right now. And the subject I love best was, was history. In fact, at the time I had an uncle um, who was a historian. I'm sure he's now largely forgotten. Uh, but he became well known in his day for giving history lectures on the newly founded ITV channel. And he went to, he just walked onto the stage without any notes, spoke for 28 minutes. At the end, a little sign would go up at the end. It's the early days of television. <laughs> he just said one minute to go and he'd walk off and he became quite a popular television historian. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. If that's what history is about, then that's what I'd like to do. The trouble was, my mother was a physiologist. In fact, she was one of the early women uh, to study physiology over there in Oxford. And I had an older brother who'd done history. I had an older brother who'd done modern languages. I had um, a sister who'd uh, done sociology. And so here I was, in the eyes of my mother, the youngest, and clearly I was her last chance to get a scientist on board in the family. And I always remember her argument, which went something like this. She said, well, you know, science has very specialist language. True. So if you do history, you'll never really be able to read science of pleasure because you won't understand the technical language. But if you do science, then you can keep reading history for pleasure for the rest of your life. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a really good argument, a good point. And so I decided to do science based on that. Here I am talking about DNA. 60 years later, and by the way, just for the record, I still do read history for pleasure. So what I'm saying here really is DNA gives us this life. It makes our existence possible. It certainly doesn't decide what we're going to do with our lives. I'm actually just writing a book for Cambridge University Press called Are We Slaves to Our Genes? And I want to give the clear answer no as part of that book, simply because the big decisions in our lives still remain ours. We might make them quickly, we might make them slowly. Those decisions are certainly not determined by our genes. We really decided we want to be here this evening as well. And the great discovery of the structure of DNA uh, by James Watson and by Francis Crick was certainly not determined by their genes either. In fact, it was on February the 28th, 1953, as the story goes, Francis Crick burst into the Eagle pub uh, there in Cambridge and announced to the startled drinkers inside that he and Jim Watson had just discovered the secret of life. And here is the plaque before you there, if you can see it, which is commemorating that rather wonderful occasion. And of course, what Crick was referring to was the fact that he and Watson had just realized that DNA was a double helix in structure, in fact, a, a discovery which has completely transformed the whole face of biology. So I want to just give you three points about DNA which illustrate how it really is the case, I think, that DNA provides us with the secret of life at one level at least. First, information. How does DNA just pack in that huge amount of information into each cell of our bodies? A chemical so small we can't even, we can't even see it under a microscope. Our DNA is composed of these four different chemical groups. We can call them genetic letters. And it's the precise sequence of those genetic letters that gives us the genetic code. The genetic code is a triplet code, so that the sequence of just three genetic letters, like GTG, for example, uh, it has a meaning. Well, what is its meaning? And the proteins, uh, its meaning is all translated, of course, into proteins. And the proteins that make up our bodies are composed of these 20 amino acids. And it's the precise sequence of those amino acids that gives them their particular properties and is why we're sitting here tonight. So GTG then provides the code for one of those amino acids, it happens to be the amino acid called valine. So if you have a GTG in the DNA sequence at that particular point, you are going to get valine in that protein. That's what you're going to get. And of course, each protein can be hundreds of amino acids long, and it's the precise sequence of those genetic letters in the DNA that defines precisely what that sequence of amino acids is going to be in that protein. 
So, of course, that also leads us on to ask what we mean by a protein encoding gene. It just refers to that sequence of letters in the DNA that encodes a complete protein. As we've just been hearing, the whole sequence of DNA uh, is actually about three billion genetic letters long. In fact, the same number of letters, as it happens, contained in 2,000 copies of Tolstoy's War and Peace. In fact, only 1.5% of these genetic letters actually encode proteins. We now know we have around 20,500 protein encoding genes in our DNA. There's a huge amount of editing involved in that process. So in fact, there are probably more than a million functional proteins which come out of those basic, that basic set of information of 25,500 encoding genes. What does the rest of the DNA do? Well, it does a lot of other things, actually. Um, there are many types of other genes. There, for example, are the 24,000 genes that encode RNA molecules. There are huge stretches of DNA as well that are involved in regulating the genes that are switched on and off and so forth. So our DNA is absolutely packed with information. Second key point about DNA. The first point, key point is information. Second key point about DNA is diversity. Diversity, really fortunately, our DNA sequence is slightly different between all of us here uh, this evening, with the exception maybe of identical twins. We all differ in around five out of every thousand of our genetic letters, which is actually quite a lot when you think about it. And that's great because it means that we are all different. If we all reproduced as one genetically identical giant clone, then life would be truly boring, I think. And if you're a teacher here this evening, uh, just think how tricky it would be to check your class if the whole class looked like identical twins. In reality, there's sufficient diversity within our DNA to make every single person who has ever lived on this planet different, and every single person who ever will live on this planet different. There's so much information there, so much variation, that there is the scope for differences between humans uh, for as long as this planet's going to be around. And of course, those small genetic differences are really, really important because during development, they operate together with the environment to ensure that we look slightly different, or personalities are slightly different, or whatever it might be. Good. Third point to highlight is communication. Communication. DNA is designed in such a way that it's perfect at communicating its information to the next generation. The famous DNA double helix immediately tells us how that works. Just imagine you have a, a coat with a zip or a top or a windsheet or something, and just imagine you unzip it down the front and you pull it apart and you just tear it in half. And if your windsheeter had the scope to then reproduce itself, so each half made an identical copy, that gives you a little idea about how uh, DNA replicates itself because it unzips straight down the double helix and then each of those strands each then make another copy of themselves. So you get two molecules of identical, pretty much identical DNA. And so every time a cell divides, the DNA replicates itself so that each daughter cell receives the same copies of the DNA. And so by passing on that DNA to the next generation, we're passing on something of ourselves. I actually think of that when I'm watching sometimes as I do that great TV series, Who Do You Think You Are? Or just look at your own family tree and think about that passage of DNA that we are passing on uh, to the next generations. And uh, quite, a, quite an interesting, moving, I think, a moving kind of insight into what DNA is doing. So every day, in fact, our bodies are making more than 200 billion new cells to replace the old ones that die, and DNA replication is involved in every single new cell that is being made every time. And the best part about it, we don't even have to think about it. I mean, I think that's so wonderful. Just imagine we had to think about that. It's all on automatic. In fact, if we took the DNA and our own cells, just one of them, and we stretched that double helix right out, it would be around six feet long about six feet long. Don't try it, get a little break, okay? But that's uh, about the distance of the DNA in a single cell. And that's those 3.2 billion nucleotides, genetic letters, which are being stretched out in that way. In fact, that means that each of us, since coming into the cathedral this evening, has made about seven million miles of DNA through cell division, and we haven't even thought about it. 
At least, I hope not. And let's say there are, I don't know, let's make the maths easy, let's say about a thousand people here this evening. Then together, we together as a community sitting here this evening have made about seven billion miles of DNA just by sitting here this evening. Not bad, I say, not bad. In fact, if you took all the DNA in your body, you stretched it out completely, it would actually stretch to the sun and back about 60 times. And that immediately tells us that the packaging of our DNA in each cell of our bodies is truly amazing. And in fact, that is absolutely uh, the case. And if you have able to see this uh, picture, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's just a, a molecular picture of the way that the DNA, the six feet of DNA is packed and coil upon coil upon coil is actually packed together um, so that it actually fits into a single cell. And that actually reminds me um, of a story. You won't see the connection of thought here until you hear the end bit of the story. So hang in there. Okay. At the church I go to in Cambridge, we have the custom of baptizing people as adults if they become a Christian. And before their baptism, they have the opportunity of just standing up the front and explaining to people uh, why, how they became a Christian, why they want to be baptized, that sort of thing. And I can remember being a little bit late for church one Sunday evening. It does <coughs> occasionally happen. And I was uh, squeezing into the back, and there was a student up the front just waiting to be baptized, and she was telling us about how she'd become a Christian. And I remember very clearly what she said. She said, I'm from mainland China. My parents are both atheists. My grandparents are both atheists. And then I came to Cambridge to study biochemistry, and one day in my first year of my biochemistry course in, in Cambridge, Natural Sciences, uh, we had a biochemistry lecture. Now, I was kind of sitting, I was sitting right at the back thinking, why is this going to go, you know? I've given many biochemistry lectures in Cambridge, but I do not talk about religion, okay, in those lectures, just to be quite clear. Anyway, she carried on, and the lecture was describing how DNA is packaged into cells so beautifully and in such an amazing way. And she said, I just sat there and thought, there must be a God who has brought all this into being. And it was that trigger that started me off on my journey to faith. And then she went on to explain how that triggered led her to do further exploration and research herself into Christian faith until finally she decided to take that particular step. Now, what was really, what was really sort of going on here, I wonder? I'm listening more to what she said later on and chatting with her and so forth. I think it was really just the beauty of that aesthetic beauty of that packaging, the beautiful packaging of the DNA that really impressed her at that moment. It's just so elegant and so organized. For her, this was some real aesthetic insight that became also a kind of religious insight at that moment in class. So just coming back then to DNA, I do sometimes wonder what I would do with DNA if I were an atheist. I guess what I'd need to believe would have to go something like this. The elegant laws of science were laid down during the first femtoseconds of the Big Bang in such a way that life was going to happen in the fullness of time. And then once stars got going in the dying moments of exploding stars, sufficient energy was given to generate these wonderful chemicals of which all our bodies are made here this evening, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, and so forth. And of course, those chemicals make up all the living things on our planet today. We're all made of stardust, as I'm sure you've been hearing um, as uh, if you came to some of the early lectures and so forth. And our solar system is just packed with complex carbon compounds. There are far more com carbon compounds up there in stellar space than there are in total here on planet Earth. Many of them land on Earth, of course, carried by meteorites around four billion years ago. Some complex compounds were synthesized, of course, right here. And then over millions of years, by this process, as we say, we don't really yet fully understand, although we have some ideas, the first DNA molecules came into being. And that was the key step, wasn't it, that really led to this proliferation, this wonderful proliferation of life that we see on this planet today. <clears throat> and out of that flourishing of life eventually came human DNA and humanity. And today our differing DNA and varying environments are sort of woven together to lead to uniquely different human beings who have this wonderful capacity for, for free will, for moral choice, for creativity, for art, for philosophy, personal relationships, love, sex, war, you can go on. Uh, not all those things we welcome, of course, but uh, they're all part of this reality of being human in this year, 2019. 
So that's my thought experiment as an atheist. And now I have to say that as a Christian, my account at the scientific level is exactly the same. Science is the same for everyone. My science is no different as a Christian from my atheist colleagues. We all share the same science. The difference between us is not about science, it's about our interpretation of science, our interpretation. It reminds me of a comment actually by the previous chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, when he said that science, and I quote from him here, science takes things apart to see how they work. Christian faith puts them together again to see what they mean. So there are many ways of knowing, and the scientific way of knowing is just one of those ways. Now, if I were an atheist, I could, of course, just say, you know, the whole thing is a giant accident. There's no rhyme or reason. Things just happen to turn out this way. Now we have human DNA. Here we are, wonderful. And our human DNA, anyway, ensures that our lives are short. So we might as well try and enjoy life whilst we have it, because ultimately, our own lives have no meaning anyway. And I personally can fully, fully understand why some people do feel that way. But there is, of course, a problem. And I think it's a pretty big problem. I think such a worldview really displays simply a lack of intellectual curiosity. Because it's the kind of human existence we've just been thinking about that raises these pretty big questions. It's a human existence that depends on this particular DNA without which we would not exist. And as we've just been thinking, DNA is absolutely packed with information. Yes, it needs decoding, but we have those decoding mechanisms in every cell of our bodies. Our DNA, as we've been thinking, also is packed with continuity. It's the reason we have families, we have communities, we have histories. I spoke earlier of having to make a choice between history and science, but actually, at the biological level, DNA is a molecule full of history. Study DNA and you're doing science, but you get the history thrown in for free. It's wonderful, actually. So our DNA also is packed with diversity, as we've been thinking that we're all different. Our relational lives are enriched as we seek complementarity with others. We're often attracted, aren't we, to those who are somewhat different from ourselves, because in them we see and feel what we know that we lack in our own beings. And in the scientific background of all those accounts we can give, it's this tightly regulated organization of the DNA so that its very structure with its elegant code shouts at me anyway precisely the opposite of randomness. It shouts as far as I can see meaning and purpose. So speaking personally, it just seems to me the existence of human DNA and therefore the existence of humanity with all our amazing personal capacities just fits better into a narrative in which a personal created God brings all things into being with particular aims and purposes in mind. When I read the scientific text of the book of biology, it reads for me at the same time like the book of the author of creation. There's nothing, there's nothing random about it. You know, when we scientists write the discussion sections of our papers, we'll often write that our data that we're presenting is consistent with our fav favorite theory at that particular time, whatever that might be. And that's the sort of approach I'm suggesting here uh, this evening. <clears throat> the existence of the beautifully elegant DNA molecule, which guarantees that we are humans with a capacity for moral decision-making, is consistent with a personal God who intended all along that this would be the case. The existence of the kind of human personal love that we, I hope we all experience at some time in our lives is consistent with a God of love who cares for us and wants a relationship with us. The existence of human minds which can begin to comprehend the wonders of the universe is also absolutely dependent on our own human DNA. This to me seems very consistent with the great creative mind behind the existence of all things. And perhaps most remarkable of all, as a Christian, I believe that God himself has taken on human flesh in the person of Christ to be this great bridge to bring us to faith in faith to him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took human DNA so that he might be truly one of us, dying on the cross for us, so that we might personally experience God's love and his salvation. I have to say that since I became a Christian just over 60 years ago, 40 of those years spent in the scientific research community, I can honestly say that I found nothing 
that in any way undermines the reality of God's love and the reality of knowing him, the God of love, in a personal way. So what we're looking for in science, what we're looking for is coherence, coherence. What theory makes best sense of the data? As far as I can see when I look at the world as a scientist, including its beautiful information-packed DNA, it is God as the author of creation, the author of the whole of existence, who best makes sense of the data and renders it most coherent. Thank you very much for your attention.